Welcome to Legion Radio, a podcast about all things e-commerce. The official podcast of the Private Label Legion, hosted by Tim Jordan. Hey everybody, it's Tim Jordan again with Legion Radio, the official podcast to be Private Label Legion, bringing you some more great content, some more great information that you can use in your e-commerce business, probably specifically your Amazon business. And today, like we normally do, we are bringing in a guest, Paulina Mason. Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, Paulina Mason. Yes. All right, cool. It's got two S's, so I didn't know if it was like really fancy Masson or, you know, like one of those. I think it is Masson, but I'm not French, so I can't pronounce (laughs) myself. (laughs) All right. Before we get started, guys, if you're listening, make sure that you're engaging with us on social media. You can find us on Private Label Legion Facebook page. Join the group, Private Label Legion free Facebook group. Check us out at hickory-flats.com. Find out about our mastermind program, our sourcing trips, all that good stuff. So, Paulina, welcome to the show. I'm so glad that we were finally able to connect I've been seeing you uh, kind of pop up on my Facebook feed for a while. You've been doing a lot of interviews and interacting with a lot of other Amazon experts. And uh, that's part of your marketing strategy now, right? Exactly right. Thanks for having me, Tim. Exactly right. That's my strategy these days. A few months ago, I started doing a lot of videos. I totally believe everything is about video these days. You know, especially since I've got on TikTok recently, I discovered that TikTok is like, if you look at Google Trends right now, you would see that TikTok was going flat, 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 flat for the last year. And the last 30 days is like... It's like the gold rush, like 2014 for Amazon. It's the gold rush of TikTok right now. So So, whatever you post basically gets a lot of views. That's what I'm saying. (laughs) That's crazy. So you and I did not plan to talk about TikTok, but TikTok's (laughs) been on the back of my mind um, for a while because I started seeing the engagement rates and like kind of these like influencers and don't even know they're influencers, right? And it started out with just like, my understanding is just goofy like little dancing videos and stuff like that. And, you know, people are getting 20,000 views on these little things. So uh, one of the things I've always wondered is like, how do you use TikTok for business? You know, are people going on there and looking for helpful information on how to start an e-commerce business? Or like, why do you think of TikTok as a, as a good venue for uh, like business information? I think, you know, actually there's many Amazon sellers that I've seen or e-commerce sellers that are using TikTok very successfully. It's like Gary Vee says, whenever the platform is new and on the boom, if you are the first to get on there, you'll get the most eyes and most notoriety and the most followers from that. So that's where people like, for example, there's this one guy selling ice cream accessories, like little sticks with flowers that you put into your ice cream once it's served, right? So he sells that and all he does on TikTok is those videos, you know, where he's mixing the ice cream you know mixing <laughs> basically all of his videos mixing and he gets i don't know like fifty thousand views for each of these videos that's a lot of people and on tiktok is not only kids anymore if you look at demographics there's a lot of hashtags that you could follow like business online business amazon and things like that so look compare youtube now these days so oversaturated whatever you post you will get like 26 views organically at best if you use good keywords right so, but on TikTok, whatever you post, you will get minimum 800 views right away. Okay, half of them will be kids, like, like people like to say. But keep in mind, these kids are 16 years old, right? And 16-year-olds these days are Generation Z, you know, who has the phone since they're two years old. By the time they're 16, it's been many, many years with the devices in their hands. So they are Amazon sellers, entrepreneurs. They know a lot about tech. So it's really, really a good platform to jump on right now. It's like the gold rush of everything. (laughs) So since I discovered it, yeah, I'm really excited about it. I didn't even uh, I didn't even know that anybody was trying to sell products on it, but it's kind of been on the back of my mind thinking about that because I, I know it's been blowing up. Um, so that's that's probably something we can have a conversation another day, more specifically about yeah. TikTok. We'll put some content together for that, but that's really good stuff. So okay. the the moral of the story is you get to um, you know based on your marketing efforts talk to a lot of sellers, a lot of industry experts, a lot of influencers in the industry, and uh, you know I kind of have that same that that same blessing to be able to do that. And it's a lot of fun. I don't know if you agree with that, but it's kind of cool to meet all these people and learn all this stuff. Yes, it is. And uh, when you and I talked about what we were going to talk about, you wanted to share some content specifically around like the psychology of buying 
So we as Amazon sellers, we need to be be kind of uh, aware of or cognizant of some psychology when it comes to how we set up our, especially like listing pricing and things like that you want to get into. But first off, I want to hear more about uh, your story. I know you're an Amazon seller. I know you are from one place, grew up in another and live in another now. So give us like the, the <laughs> two minute right. history. Like, how did you go from, uh, you know, where you started with, you know, your professional career, you know, I guess since you got to school to owning a Amazon related software business and being an Amazon seller yourself? So I'm actually a software developer by background. So I went to school in Canada uh, for computer science. And in my class, there were the founders of Shopify, you know, and oh, other nice. startups that were later acquired by Shopify. I happened to study in Ottawa where Shopify's headquarters are. And I've been so encouraged by everyone on my in, in my class, you know, to start my own startup, even though I had no idea if I even wanted. I was not feeling entrepreneurial. I just, you know... So eventually they sort of convinced me, you know, I, I wanted to be like them. I wanted to be cool and awesome. You know? <laughs> so I had this Sony Vaio laptop that was a Windows laptop, you know, and then I look around left and right and I see everyone is with a MacBook and I'm like the only one with the Windows machine. And I was like, oh my God, okay, I need to buy a MacBook. And so by copying those guys, you know, okay, I need a MacBook. I need to think about a startup idea. I need this, you know. So I, I, in the beginning of our entre entrepreneurship journey, every one of us, we don't know what to do yet. We don't have those feelers. Like right now we feel, ah, this is going to work, this is not going to work because we tried it all. But in the beginning, you have no idea what's going to work, what's not going to work. So what you do is you copy, you know, you copy other people. And exactly that's what, how I started, you know, by copying other people. And then got into the startup world right after the uh, graduation. Well, I did work in the corporate world. I, I went to EA Games for four months and uh, IBM for four months. And I decided that cubicle life is not for me. <laughs> so I dropped those contracts and decided that I want to do my own thing. So it's been a long time. Uh, by now it's 10 years that I am an online entrepreneur and discovered Amazon in 2015, just about when the gold rush started. Yep. When the Google trends started showing uh, eBay going down and Amazon FBA going up. And that's exactly when I jumped on. Is that when you started as well? Yeah, it was 2015. Um, and I kind of found, I found out by accident. It sounded like you were a little more analytical. You were seeing trends and I just kind of happened to fall into it uh, and got <laughs> lucky, I guess. So, uh, but you're right. The gold rush when it was, when it was easy. So you started selling online, but you had this background of uh, development and you wanted to create some sort of tool or software, I assume. And of all the tools or software that you could have picked to develop, you picked what is now known as Shopkeeper, which is basically like a reporting and analysis tool, right? That's right. Like a profit dashboard. So why did you pick that? I mean, everybody's going for search term you know, um, <laughs> PPC <stuff> software. Or, <laughs> yeah, like a PPC software optimization. <laughs> like, why did you go for basically data reporting? I've always been a numbers person. I really, really like numbers. And, you know, there's not so many girls who are in general software developers on numbers. You know, this, usually math people are, are men. And I always felt that I'm like this math person who really likes technology and likes the numbers and data analytics and things like that. So just from that, you know, thing of mine that it came about. And actually, I just developed a little prototype of my own when I was a seller I thought okay none of the software does put all the marketplaces together and convert it to Canadian dollars for me you know I want to see my profit today in Canadian dollars I don't want to go see 599 Mexican dollars and Japanese yen and I'll put all those together so I just developed little you know a little bit of software hacked up together basically that was working for me doing the same thing so what do you do you use a real-time currency converter uh, right now we are using Yahoo Finance, uh, I believe, is the API that we use. And um, it just takes the today's currency exchange and applies to, to the conversions. Yes. Gotcha. So no matter where I'm at, I can have everything converted to U.S. dollars, Canadian dollars, British pounds. Yes, Whatever. whichever currency you choose as your first currency. But that's basically not the main feature anymore. Like it was one of the ones that yeah. I wanted in the beginning. 
but the point of the software is not only to show you your profit, but to help you manage by exception. You come, you look, and you first see what's wrong. If you have hundreds of SKUs, it's very hard to, you know, analyze, oh, this one made $500, this one $400. It tells you nothing, that data. But in our app, you could see whatever is red. You have to go and work on those things. Why this one's red? Okay, it's storage fees kicked in. Oh, my God, I actually didn't make any money last month on this one. And that's the first one you'll go and work on. So basically, it helps you manage by exception. You work on things that are broken first. And that's the whole point of having a software like that. Man, that's awesome. That is uh, that is extremely helpful because so many people look at data and don't know how to analyze it. You know, they look at spreadsheets, they look at reports, and they don't know what to do. So it sounds like you've actually got a feature in there that alerts them like, hey, this is a problem, which is great. You know, yeah. it's not that By entrepreneurs are dumb or stupid or can't figure out the stuff, but we're not all geared towards looking at data or being analytical, or we're just looking at so much that we can't always keep up. So those little helpful things for solopreneurs are, are super, super valuable. So um, tell us, uh, you know, like something interesting about yourself. I know you've lived all over the world and a lot of our listeners are here in the U.S. Um, you know, tell us something interesting about yourself related to, to business. So many of the listeners probably have this DNA in them, which is called entrepreneurship. And some people call it ADD, <laughs> you know. Yep. It's the thing that you can't stick with one thing for too long. Your mind is always creating, 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 and maybe not so good at implementing for long term something, right? Exactly. So I am exactly the type, and I've in the while I before now I know who I am, and now I know that I'm not good at implementing, so I delegate, right? I learned who I am by now. But in the beginning, I was just jumping around from thing to thing and trying to discover. I thought, okay, I'll make a career. I'll, you know, go and be working on cruise ships. So I went and worked on cruise ships and I thought, oh, I'll make a career there, travel the world. And I did. And then one and a half year later, I decided, okay, that's not a thing anymore. Let's move on. And, you know, probably many, many listeners can relate exactly to what I'm talking about. You just keep jumping from thing to thing and you're thinking that, you know, you are making a career or you justify it in some way, but actually you are just covering up your essential being that you are actually an entrepreneur, a creator. And that's the biggest power in you. Everywhere you go, you know, you, you consume the new information, something undefined that the rules are not set yet. And then you put some things together and you invent something new. And then you could give to others to implement it. So we are all the creators, you know, and I just totally traveled around the world, jumping from job to job and until I finally discovered who I am and what I want to be. And um, those guys in my class in computer science totally helped me with that to become an entrepreneur. Nice. So um, <laughs> I think that your story probably resonates with a lot of us bouncing around, trying to figure out what we want to do. Um, probably a lot of us still still get uh, flack from our family, assuming we still haven't figured out what we want to do. You know, <laughs> this isn't even a real job or anything. So uh, I know that we we had kind of talked earlier about how we're going to talk about pricing psychology. And you're very analytical. Uh, you look at the numbers. I suspect that you have some data to support this and you have some experience as a seller yourself. So I've seen some other some other piece of content you've put out there where you talk about something that a lot of people might think is a little bit silly. And that is, you know, like how many cents you put at the end of your pricing um, or on your listing. And we're all talking about keywords. And we all talk about images, but nobody talks about the pricing. So how did you come to this realization that this is actually something very important? And can you give us some, some of kind of your, your best tips or best practices related to this? Sure. All right. Just as the prayer starts outside my doors, <laughs> I am in Turkey. So there's a prayer outside the window, uh, which happens five times a day. So you may hear some, something that sounds like music in my background. Cool. <laughs> so, all right, let's start with this very interesting topic of pricing psychology. I guess I'll give you a few interesting bits right away so that you don't feel bored and phase out of it. <laughs> <All right. laughs> So, okay, let's start with the interesting, especially what you asked about the endings. You know how everywhere around you, you see 99, 99s, and people like to end prices in 99 these days, everywhere in retail stores and everywhere around the world. 99, sometimes they use 95 or 97 as well. So it's, it's very commonly used 5, 7s, and 9s. Those are so-called charm digits. So now what happens? Why they're using it? It's very common sense. Why they're doing 99? Well, because 29.99 comparing to 30. 
first one is 20 something second one is 30 something so obviously the 20 something seems cheaper and people like that so that's not what i was gonna tell you because you know that already yeah. but what happened to us because we see so many 99 99 99 everywhere because we see it so much we got used to believing it that it's a bargain of some kind that you are getting a bargain it's some sort of a good deal you know if it's 99 99 something is good good deal and when it's a bargain it's very often cheaper and when it's cheaper unfortunately it's lower quality item so now that's where you can play up a little bit so if the 99 is associated with a lower quality lower price and a bargain if you don't want to be positioned as a lower quality item you want to position your item as luxury item you could do the endings of zero zero just round round numbers and that will automatically people don't actually stop and think about the price too much it's just like driving it happens automatically you know no. you look at it and you see oh zero zero at the end so it's not 99 so it's not a bargain so it must be better must be good, must be luxury, right? So it's, it's a little bit of that little bit of difference that makes you feel like something's unusual about it, must be different, you know, so it's better. So it's interesting. But the key part from that five, seven, and nine, you know, 995, I think Walmart is using, and sevens in the end, internet marketers really like to use when they're selling courses and things like that. They use sevens in the end, right? So so-called charm numbers five seven and nine is really important to use in your pricing as you normally adjust your prices when you're trying to tweak your prices to sort of play on the pricing psychology for example if you have a price of 34 dollars it's recommended to switch to 39 dollars or if you can't do that big of a jump you will switch to 35 dollars just to use the price charm prices in the end so they say that there's been research done online that the 34 converts less than the 39 does because when you're skimming all of the prices you're just skimming skimming it's so fast that you do it if it has a nine in it it feels automatically your brain is driving for you and you're feeling like oh it's a better deal you know you skip the fours so you skip the fours the sixes and eights so my suggestion is if you have any price that is ends with the even number it's highly recommended that you switch that up you know if you can jump that high from 34 to 39 it's good but most of us can't you know if we are playing very close with the competitors you could just jump a few dollars you know to the five to the seven or nine at the end so, so that's if the we're first jumping tip. to 35 it would be like 35 97 so we've got odd numbers for the dollars and the cents right I would just do 99. I wouldn't put 97 in the end because there's another thing that plays into everything. It's the complexity. So the easier the comprehension of the price, the easier the, the conversion is going to be. I mean, conversions in terms of just click click-ins into your listing. So more sessions, right? So if you make it uh, 35, 97, you're adding a complexity. There's too many digits that are different and you have to sort of, again, stop and think about it too much. So if you just put 99, that's the most common one that is used the ending of 99 just put the 99 so 35 99 i would do you know and um, with that complexity there are m many other things that i could mention but it's important especially when you're offering coupons so there's a combination of price and the coupon right so don't make something like 21.79 is the price and the coupon is 15%. So to figure it out, I have to, okay, so 10% is $2.10 and then, okay, another five is like one, okay, and about $3. So you made me think, you know, so much that most of us will not even go there. You will just squint your eyes. Okay, that's too hard. I'm moving on. <laughs> so, and then you go to the listing that is very easy, $21 price and $3 off. You know, so quick and so easy. You can just see, oh, $18 I'm paying. In like millisecond, oh, $18 I'm paying. And here you're like scratching your head and thinking. So don't make them think too much because the comprehension actually plays into that quick, you know, uh, quickness of them clicking into your listing. And you want them to have their eyes on your listing as long as possible. The longer they are invested in it, the longer they're looking at it, the more likely they will convert at it. So there's a lot of different things that you could play up when you're using coupons as well. So for example, like I said, there's this price $21 and $3 off, right? But you could actually offer $4 off, right? And now think, which one would be better when you have a price of $21? Which one is actually better to offer to a customer? $3 off or $4 off from $21? What do you think? 
Probably three, because I don't know. It sounds like you're trying to trick me, and that seems like the least obvious answer. So <laughs> that's a good way to think about it. <laughs> exactly, most people would say the four dollars because it is a higher amount, bigger discount. But the real answer is why the three is better. Now try to quickly calculate it. Twenty-one dollar price and four dollars off. Okay, one to the side and minus three. Okay, seventeen. You see, you have to do the one to the side. And with 21 and $3 off, you don't have to do it. Now, why you don't have to do it is because we learned this multiplication table over and over and over and over, you know, when we were kids, right? One times seven, seven, two times seven, 14, three times seven, 21. So we, it's so much in our brain that we automatically, you know, if it's a multiple in the price, it's easier to comprehend. So you are trying to, to set up your prices that as, as easy to comprehend as possible. So that will attract more eyes to this thing so these are little things and you may think that they may not you know affect it so much but when you are in between the competitors who have complex pricing and you are the easy one you know every little single little bit helps if you have a coupon enabled which is these days very bright green color not orange color anymore it used to be orange and used to blend in with all the oranges on the on the page or amazon branding has a lot of oranges and the coupon highlight used to be orange and now it's green so just the fact that you will enable the coupon it will shine green light there it will attract an eye and if you have very very simple comprehensible price like 21 and three dollars off it's immediately getting much more attention than you would think you know so these these things really play a part in it and I've heard this from other other experts who talking about, you know, dollar off versus percentage, just so it's easier to, for us to figure out. One place I've heard about it a lot is like the affiliate world. You know, if you're affiliate selling, you want to give these affiliate sellers, you know, a base price. And, you know, if you use our code, we'll discount this many dollars and you as an affiliate will get this many dollars because it's easier to make a decision. We can do the math quickly in our head. So instead of trying to figure out, you know, these double down percentages, just, oh, every time I sell this product or this service or whatever, I get $25 instead of trying to do the math and twenty three ninety one or whatever the number is, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's a whole lot easier. So I think there's def definitely something you said there, but that's a little bit different than what we see like in brick and mortar and traditional retail, which is, you know, percentage off coupons, you know, hey, this is 50% off, 25% off. So I think that intuitively we would think about doing a percentage, but it does make sense to just do a dollar amount because it's easier to make a purchase decision. So definitely agree with you. Um, I've also heard you talk about some tweaks related to free shipping. So in, when we're yeah. adding our listing and we're setting up our listing and we're adding our pricing, what is this about the free shipping that you suggest? Uh, so I recommend to work around the free shipping offering, which is, you know, th if you're not a prime member on amazon.com, there is this $25 that you have to spend in order to get it shipped for free to you. Right. And yep. every marketplace has this threshold, like France, 29 euros, for example. So you as a seller could play with that a little bit in terms of your pricing. I had this one item that I was selling for $20.99 and I was calculating, okay, if this guy doesn't have Prime membership, how much is going to pay for shipping? And it was $5.50 extra on top of that. So it was like $6.50 he was paying and $26.50 he was paying. I was saying, wait a minute, $26.50. So now if I just increase my price to be above the free shipping threshold, so be $25.99, then suddenly he's not paying for shipping. So he's actually going to save 50 cents on shipping. I'm going to make extra $5, you know, in profit. And that's a lot because all of my units are usually just $5 in profit. So it's, it's a big jump significantly. And I'm thinking I could monetize a lot on that, you know, and in fact, that free shipping option on the sidebar of Amazon search there's this tick box, you know, check box where you can check free shipping. And it's actually the most popular feature on, on the search sidebar, you know, to click the free shipping. Not, check so box. not prime it's free shipping is the most clicked. Uh, wait, is it called the prime right now? Let me, well, you can have either. If you're not a prime member, it's free shipping, I think. Right. Yeah, I don't have a data on what happens when you are a Prime member. I was describing the non-Prime member sure. situation. Yeah, yeah, it is the free shipping checkbox. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, uh, so that's the one which is very, very popularly used. And basically, when 
they check that checkbox. You suddenly appear in those listing results, right? And with extra benefit to you. And you may say, Paulina, no, it's nonsense. I cannot really jump from $21 to $25.99. That's too big of a jump. This doesn't happen in my price ranges. Well, okay, just look at all of your listings that you have right now. If you have anything that is like $24, you know, or $23, just below that free shipping threshold, it's highly recommended just to jump a dollar or two above so you are above and you're going to grab those non-prime members as well you know and like i said all of these little things they don't do big impact on themselves but if you enable the coupon you change your prices to be more comprehensible use five sevens and nines plus you're gonna enable you know jump up above the free shipping threshold and all of these other tweaks that you could do all of them you know cumulative effects like you have a, a really nice compound effect and then it actually does affect your ranking and how many sales you make Nice. So let me ask you this. You get to deal with um, a lot of different educators, a lot of different um, influencers, a lot of different sellers, and you're a seller yourself. As you're kind of embarking on this journey of, of capturing this really big kind of viewpoint on the whole Amazon thing, what do you see as one of the biggest mistakes that people make, either as a beginner or as an advanced seller, that, that you wish you could just scream at everybody, hey, stop doing this or start doing this differently? What would that one thing be? Many, many people, when I, I'm going to continue about the prices, because I think in pricing strategy, they make this one big mistake. And I did it also. When I started, the way I would decide my prices is I would think, okay, how much maximum I'm going to spend on this kind of item? Okay, $36. I would never pay 45. Who's going to pay 45? So that's it. That was my decision. 36 is my top price and I'm going to use the 36. And many of us are using the financial limitation box of our own to decide our pricing. And that I think is the biggest mistake when you're not considering the whole range of possible buyer types that exist. So there are three types of buyers uh, on e-commerce. So there's the bargain hunters, so-called Scrooges. And yep. then there are the luxury buyers. So basically who are not, you know, affected by the price that much. And there's the middle. And research has been done that there's 15% of those luxury buyers, 24% of the Scrooges, and the rest is 61%. So I was looking at that and I was, that's how I came up with this strategy. And I thought, okay, let me calculate how much money can I make if I play, if I choose to play in one of these buckets, you know, which one is the most profitable. And to me, it seemed like, okay, luxury buyer probably going to be the most money because the price is the biggest. Actually, it wasn't the case because there's not so many of them. It's only 15% of those luxury buyers, even though the price is much higher, still it's the second best place to be. So if you can be in the middle box when you're not, you know, for those Scrooges and you're not the very high priced item is the best, most money you can make in the middle. So now when you are deciding your initial pricing strategy, before you even develop your product, before you go to your manufacturer, you should know which box you're going to play in. Now that is very important because it will affect how your product is going to look like, right? So if I'm looking at the box, I'm going to put in my main keyword, and check the listings. What is the situation right now? And I will see, okay, so many people are playing this middle game and nobody is doing the luxury one. Okay, there is space for me in the luxury space, right? So you're going to look at the situation, who's playing what game? Maybe all of them are doing the bargain hunters game, you know, and maybe you don't want to go there. So it always depends on your competitors, but be careful on that moment. Don't judge everything from today. You're going to open it and judge it from that. Actually, you have to look at historical averages of each of the competitors' prices because maybe today they run out of stock or running a promotion. Anything could happen. Sometimes competitors are not even on the list to, you know, search results because they're out of stock at the moment. But you're going to develop your product and then boom, there's this big competitor, you know. So be careful. Check the data for historical averages and check like, you know, twice a month just to make sure that you have all of them in there. And then see who's playing what and choose your space where is not enough players and you think you carve out your own niche. And now, okay, once you know that you're going to play for the luxury buyer type, 
Then you're going to your manufacturer and if you're selling like a knife sharpener, you will say, all right, let's change the metal piece to be stainless steel. Let's, um, you know, change this piece to be better, add a velvet bag, add a nice box. So it becomes a luxury product, you know, and if you're going to play the bargain hunter game, of course, you're going to downplay all of that. Okay, how can we save on costs? Remove that plastic, remove this, you know, completely different product becomes. So you basically have to know your pricing strategy way, way before you even go to China and talk to them. So sure. that is probably the, the biggest mistake, I think, is to quickly deciding the price on your own box. So try to climb out of that box when you're thinking about it and, you know, consider all the different buyer types that exist for your particular product. Nice. All right. So are you going to any, uh, do you go to any Amazon seller events, conferences, meetups? Yes, I definitely what are your favorite, do. What are your favorite to go to? So I, I went to a so, so because I'm in Turkey, I go to the European European ones. Yeah. I guess I will not mention the American ones because that's a little far to travel uh, with the little kids. So I went to Prague, uh, the uh, European Seller Conference. I I was also at Seller Fest Israel, and I'm gonna go to Cross Border Summit and Global Sources in China. Um, there's a few others. I don't know why they uh, skip my mind right now. There were a few others that I attended as well. So I uh, yeah, am a first in UK. Uh, so when that is that? Was when it was May, end of May. And okay. they actually have it twice a year. I think one is going to be in maybe January. Uh, I think so. So this twice a year. It's a, it's a very nice event. Uh, a lot of sellers came. So usually mm -hmm. people, after I, I give a, a talk and uh, talk about pricing strategy or similar topics, they come to me and they show me the phone, you know, after, and they say, Paulina, let's decide my pricing strategy, like what I am doing wrong. And, you know, I'm telling you all of these strategies, but sometimes the case is just to match your competitor, you know, even though there are so many different strategies that you could use, but if you are like the second listing after the best seller and you, you know, he's doing $25 with 10% off, well, do $25 with 10% off. Because then you, if you exactly match his price for the person who's considering you to, it just becomes the choice of the picture and the title and the reviews, right? There's no more of this consideration of price. Oh, this $1 cheaper. Why he's doing cheaper? Because he wants my sale. Okay, I'm not going to give him that sale because that one is more, you know, don't make them think all of these things. Just match exactly the competitor's price with his coupon amount. And that sometimes is the best strategy, ignoring all the rest that I said. So, you know, uh, it depends on your situation. Gotcha. And are you selling in EU, UK and US? Yes. And Japan as well. Oh, yes. nice. Very cool. I'm, uh, we'll have to set up another, another conversation. I'd love to ask you more about how things are going in the EU and the UK and what you think of what's going to happen with Brexit and if that's going to change some things and all that good stuff. Are you selling in uh, Europe yourself? No, I've tried selling cross-border and had so many complications. It wasn't really worth the time for me. So okay. I got in a situation where it was like, you know, I can spend this time and effort just developing more products to keep selling in the U.S., but yeah. I've got some stuff going on right now trying to uh, figure out where my next expansion is and trying to figure out where I'm going to get the best bang for the buck. And I know like Germany is blowing up right now. Um, you know, I, I didn't know this till recently, but Germany is the second largest marketplace that Amazon even has. I figured UK would have been, but Germany is the second largest. Germany is, but don't forget, also Germany is the number one for refund rate. <laughs> you know, oh, they actually a yeah, lot see, of refunds that. in See, Germany. we're going to have to do a whole new podcast just <laughs> talking about <laughs> your experience your, in those yeah. different places. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> There's a lot to say about that. Yeah, there is. All right, cool. We'll wrap it up. Any other last words of wisdom you'd like to share briefly before we sign off? Anything random, interesting? Random, interesting. Use the bundles, you know, run for, th so start a product and don't do bundles right away and look at yep. the data one year later at your business reports on Seller Central and check which one has, you know, a lot of orders and double, at least double that many units that they bought. So look at the average number of units that they buy. And if the item is more like, there's always at least two units that they buy, that's a perfect product to bundle. Because when you bundle, you automatically make more money from 
each unit individually because you are saving on the FBA fee. You know, FBA fee doesn't double up when you add another unit. A referral fee does, the 15%. It doubles up any extra unit that you add to the bundle. But FBA fee grows slowly, and that's exactly what you can monetize. So it's highly recommended to look at all your existing stats and see which products you could actually bundle, send in some bundles, and uh, they will, you know, offer a customer like $1 off when they're buying a bundle. This will be an incentive, and you will make uh, extra money as well just because you are monetizing under the FBA fee. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for all this information. I feel like you've <laughs> given us a lot to think about. Now I'm like, I've been sitting here making notes on my phone of all the, the other <laughs> questions we'll ask later and, uh, and pick your brain over. So we'll go ahead and sign off right now, guys. Thanks for listening to the podcast. We appreciate uh, all the support and encouragement you give us. If you have any questions for Paulina, um, Paulina, how can they get a hold of you? So you could go to shopkeeper.com and there's the little orange bubble that you could um, send us a message through. If you want to contact me directly, it's paulina at shopkeeper.com. And do you want a present? I could give you a present for those who listen to me so carefully. Heck I, yeah. <laughs> sometimes I do it when I feel like it. There's this coupon code that I sometimes share that can give you six months of free trial for Shopkeeper. Oh my goodness, and six months free trial. <laughs> usually people give like two months free trial, right? When they do promos. But I decided I'll use the Black Friday, which is approaching. And on Black Friday, we do do the six month free trial. So all you have to do is to go on shopkeeper.com and there's the orange chat bubble. Just type in the code STINGRAY180. You know the fish, the stingray? Yep. So all all capitals stingray 180 and once you type it in the agent will get back to you and your account will be made into vip account so you can enjoy the six months free trial especially useful if you're a new beginner and you don't have a money to spend for any apps yet and you're just figuring out what costs you the most like are you even making money and looking at 72 different fees so you know it's quite useful i guess when yeah, well, that's out. very generous. Thank you. That's six months. That's a half a year, guys. That's a long time. Take <laughs> advantage of that for sure. Um, shopkeeper.com. You've got Stingray 180. All capital letters is the code there. Make sure that you take advantage of that and hit Paulina up on her email. If you have any questions, I know that she's uh, more than happy to do what she can to help people give some advice. Uh, if you haven't done so already, like we talked about at the beginning of the show, make sure that you go to our Facebook page, Private Label Legion, hit the like button, join our Facebook group, Private Label Legion. And if you're listening to this on YouTube or watching this on YouTube, I guess, go ahead and hit the subscribe button so you'll get notified of new content, new information that we're putting out. We've got a lot of great stuff coming down the pipeline we're going to be giving to you. And Paulina, thank you so much. I know it's it's late there in Turkey right now. I uh, appreciate yeah. you taking the time, though, to connect with us and share this information. And uh, I'm sure I'll be leaning on you to give us more information here in the near future. Thank you very much, Tim. Thanks for having me. You've just wrapped up another episode of Legion Radio, hosted by Tim Jordan. Past episodes, links, and show notes can be found at privatelabellegion.com.